Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. Two Alamo historians travel America, a history road trip from San Antonio to El Paso to Washington, D.C., then back home to San Antonio. That's more than 4,000 miles. And along the way, they uncovered connections to the Alamo that are often overlooked. Today, we reveal what they learned on their journey from the Shrine of Texas Liberty to the nation's capital and the small towns in between. I'm your host, Emily Bauckham. We're joined by Colby Lanham, the Alamo's senior researcher and historian, and Thomas Ledesma, the Alamo's researcher. Thanks so much for sitting down with us. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to be here. Yeah, glad to be back. The reason for this road trip was to help spread the word about the Alamo plan. At what point did you guys look at a map and decide, hey, let's make this a real life history lesson? Yeah, I guess kind of like from the beginning, wasn't it? So we knew we were going to be making two major stops. Uh, we went to Houston to Clute, Texas, uh, what, day before that? Yeah, that Friday before. Yeah, that Friday before. Went down to Clute, Texas and talked to some teachers down there about the Alamo. So and then we drove back and we were driving back. We knew we'd go to El Paso and then we we're going to make a stop in D.C., and we thought, man, we're going to be driving across, you know, the greater part of the United States, the lower part of it, mm-hmm. at least. And um, we immediately started thinking about all the ties to Texas that we could stop at. While you were still in Texas, you stopped at Fort Davis, about 400 miles west of the Alamo. What did you find there? Fort Davis was a really pleasant surprise. I'd never been. Have you been out there, Thomas? No, no it's first no, time for me. I, I, yeah, first time for both of us. And, and I was very surprised at how beautiful that country was. My goodness, the, the big, beautiful Davis Mountains. Yeah. Um, and then driving into the fort there, um, I felt I felt there what I don't feel at the Alamo sometimes is the emptiness, mm-hmm. because the Alamo at one time was kind of the frontier. It was the edge of of you know the known area of Texas, and Fort Davis still has that feel to it. I mean, what did you feel? I felt the same way. It, it's a location where you're able to walk through the grounds and feel that you're there in. 1850 up until 1890s when there's really nothing going on out there you have think of the soldiers going by there some of the famous soldiers that went out there a lot of them that gained their notoriety in the civil war and i think their their claim that they're saying is they're one of the best pre-civil war forts out west in in existence and true they've done a great job we were there and we were jokingly saying we were going to stay because they had a um conference going on they were doing um adobe like adobe, adobe conference. workshop yeah it was awesome so we were just kind of watching them for a little bit trying to pick up some stuff they were repairing like the old buildings and stuff and thomas was like we should just stay no one will even know we just say we were from the alamo we show up um but i do have to say a, a huge shout out to the staff there yeah because we showed up unannounced and we kind of just dropped it on them and said hey could we speak to someone who might be able to tell us a little bit about the history and the ties between the alamo and fort davis and luckily a, a park ranger there named sebastian flores um, was very knowledgeable. He's a weapons expert, if I remember correctly. Yeah, artillery guy. Yeah, generalist as well on the site history. And um, he really laid down a great bedrock for our visit. It was it was awesome. But the rest of the staff was just there great. So what are the ties between Fort Davis and the Alamo? With the expansion of the, well, annexation of Texas to the United States in, in 1845, and then after the Mexican War, 1848-49, the United States now gains this massive chunk of territory from Texas all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And being able to monitor and establish a presence in that area, not only in these vast open areas, but along the border between Mexico and the United States is very important. And so these frontier posts are created. And where's the quartermaster depot for these posts? Well, the main one's going to be San Antonio at the Alamo, later on moved to Fort Sam Houston. But a lot of the goods and supplies are brought from San Antonio, the Alamo, out to places like Fort McCavitt that serve as a outer logistics hub to send them out to places like Fort Davis, Fort Stockton, which is another place we stopped by. Yeah. The staff was great there too. Yeah, the San Antonio Road is, is yeah. kind of, you know, it, it juts right through both of those forts. And, and when we talk about supply moving, supplies moving westward like that, we're not just talking about like hard tack and, and, and uh, equipment for the men, like their uniform and stuff. We're talking about also firearms and artillery mm-hmm. are moving from the U.S. arsenal in here in San Antonio. And it, it's a huge undertaking, and therefore that road needed protection. And that's why the fort's going to spring up along that road. What is there to see when you go yeah. to Fort Davis? You brought back some photos and videos of what looked like artillery. Yeah, some of the artillery that's out there, um, it turned out that to be original from what I could tell. Um, they, they had plenty of artillery out there to protect themselves. You know, I, I, I love to see that side of the fort, to see the artillery, to see wagons, to see all the supplies, to see their beds. Yeah. Uh, they recreated a whole um, barrack, which is really cool. 
I would also like to see that they played baseball and they were normal men and they were just kind of living out their lives and they weren't all Texans. They were from all over the place. And I, I, that was kind of neat for me. The hospital exhibit was really cool. If you go out there, you have to see that. They've redone it and it's very, very well done. Yeah, I agree. Moving outside of Texas now, I was surprised by just how much Alamo history you found in Virginia because we think of Virginia as a place that's central to the founding of the United States and not necessarily a place with connections to Texas. It's interesting that you see so many people coming from Virginia and some of these mid-Atlantic states, southern states coming into Texas. It makes sense, though, if you look at the migration patterns of people in the 1820s and 1830s. Of course, you have a gigantic economic crash in uh, about 1818, 1819, and a lot of those people on the frontier are moving west looking for new opportunity. And two of the guys that mention here probably a little bit later are going to be Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin and, and finding their roots there was, was really exciting. You visited the birthplace of Stephen F. Austin. That's in the Austinville, Leadville, Virginia area. Yeah, I have to admit, um, as a historian, one of the great things about being a historian is, yes, you can become a generalist and you can acquire all this knowledge, but it's also fun when you arrive at, at a location like that and you had no idea you were going to find that. I did not know that, you know, and, and I know you, uh, Thomas had seen uh, Sam Houston's birth site before uh, a couple months prior when you're up there for a visit. But um, the Austinville uh, thing was just kind of neat. And getting out there in that field, it was early morning. No one was out there. It was very solemn. What do you see there? The, the rolling hills were the first thing I saw in a big, beautiful uh, sunburst coming up over the hills. And it, you look at the hillside just scattered with big, tall trees lead down to the river. The river is a pretty large uh, body of water. And you start thinking about Austin and his family and what they would have saw. You're staring at the same hillside. Uh, you're staring at the same river. And you can't help but be transported back to that. I agree. We were just coming down the highway. And we had a conversation about Stephen F. Austin before that. And we're just driving. And I, we look out and say, hey, Stephen F. Austin's birth site, it, it, it's on the way. So it's eight minutes on GPS. Let's turn off the highway. So we did. And like Colby said, it took us through these rolling farmland hills and this beautiful park that they set up there with a monument to him um, on the new river and it was beautiful that morning the sun was perfect everything everything was pretty awesome you also found the birthplace of sam houston near lexington virginia yeah so like colby mentioned i had just came back from that area about a week before we started our trip and the reason i was there was i was in pennsylvania talking to folks at the mifflin county historic society which shout out to those great folks and my hosts there uh, nancy and ben I was conversing with them, telling them that later on after I did that presentation, I was headed to Virginia for one of my best friend's wedding. Shout out Kristen and Chad. And uh, they said, oh, we don't want you to have to get a rental car to do that. We'll drive you to Virginia. That's so nice. So they did. They drove me all the way down there and I was getting ready for my friend's wedding and I'm driving to the location. I see Sam Houston Way. I'm like, wait a minute. And I remember that she had told me that it was going to be on that area where he was born. And so I did see the monument there the first time, took some pictures for later. And then happens to be, we look at the chart for how we're going to get up to D.C. and we're going to go past that same way. So we just made a little turn off the road and we were able to take some pictures and, and take it in there. What were you able to learn about what the families of Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston did in Virginia? As we took in those two sides, we started to see the economical impact they must have had. Um, you know, the, the founding of Austinville, which was beneficial to the area, about how they were contributing to a society and the economy. Austin carries that knowledge into uh, Missouri and then down into Texas, and it translates well down here because that's what the Mexican government's looking for, industrious people to help build up the economy. And so you could see that uh, both of those birthplaces, and mind you, they're 120 miles apart, born the same year. And so they're, they're kind of having an impact on the area at the same time. So that was really interesting. And they both end up in Texas. Yeah, yeah there you go. GTT, gone to Texas. Another interesting stop in Virginia, you visited Manassas National Military Park. That's a Civil War site, but you learned about a really interesting Alamo connection there. Yeah, it should be prefaced a little bit that whenever Thomas and I are on road trips, we listen to audiobooks a lot. And one of our favorite audiobooks is Rebel Yell by S.C. Gwynn, which chronicles the life of Stonewall Jackson. And Manassas was already on our on our bucket list, so we're like, we're going, you know. Yeah. And when we're driving up there, I, th I started thinking about it, and I asked Thomas, I said, you know, I know James Butler Bonham's brother is a Civil War general from South Carolina. I wonder, you know, where all he was, because maybe we could stop and do a tie there. And sure enough, Battle of Manassas, he was there, which was just a neat thing to find. Millage Bonham joins the U.S. Army, fights in the Mexican War, 
goes back to South Carolina and he's getting involved in local politics and then state politics. And when South Carolina secedes from the Union, he joins the Confederate forces and he becomes uh, the Brigadier General of the 1st Brigade uh, of South Carolina. So mainly made up of South Carolinians, some other state troops end up there. Um, and on the eve of Manassas or Bull Run, he's actually in charge of the entire Confederate force there before uh, General Beauregard shows up. So Millage is running the show. When Beauregard shows up, he is ordered to take his troops to watch over a, a river crossing, so to kind of defend the Confederate lines. But the tie we make there is we think of these men that we know from the Alamo. People are familiar with the story, Crockett, Bowie, Travis. Um, Bonham is one of those names that floats around, and people sort of come and visit, and they say, I've heard that name before. What did he do? And we talk about his, his um, dedication to the cause of Texas, but also his uh, acts as a courier during the siege. And it shows that maybe these older siblings have an influence on their younger ones on a life of service or, or something like that. Heading back home, you stopped at a few places in Tennessee. And in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, you really uncovered a lot of research about Crockett. Lawrenceburg is one of my favorite cities in the entire state of uh, Tennessee. I've been there many, many times. And it seems like I'm always in a rush when we get there. Because the first time I went through was several years ago. And I'm flying through Tennessee, trying to meet family in another state. And sure enough, I'm driving and I see David Crockett State Park. I was like, what in the world? And I stop there and I get really excited. They have a museum. And when I get into the lobby of the building, they said, oh, well, it's closed. And I told them, I said, well, uh, okay, you know, no big deal. And they said, where are you from? And I said, San Antonio. I told them I worked at the Alamo. They said, oh my God, no. And they called the park ranger and they came and let us in. Uh, and I got to see the museum. And from that point on, I love that city. And um, I told Thomas on the way down, we have to stop there because it is an important site for David Crockett and his life. It is a big turning point for him. And so we stopped there and we went to the uh, county clerk's office. And I had done this on my first trip. I had heard they had a book there. And it was the county register of sorts where he is uh, justice of the peace. And it also has James K. Polk who signed in there to uh, practice law in that county. We went in there, and there are some really nice ladies working inside there. It's kind of their, like their DMV as well. Yeah, they're in li a lot of license plate registration yeah. that day. <laughs> so we just got in line. <laughs> we're standing in line with our cowboy hats on. Everyone's kind of staring at us. And um, sure enough, they asked what we're there for, and we tell them. And I even told them, I said, I know that sounds like a little bit of a lie, like I made that up, but that'd be a really intricate lie <laughs> to tell someone. And uh, gave them my card, and sure enough, they rolled out the red carpet for us. They gave us uh, access to that book, supervised access to that book. They let us uh, look through it. It was a really neat experience for them to have such a beautiful artifact in their collection. And those ladies were so very kind, as was the um, gentleman running the entire uh, office. Yeah, the county clerk. So Miss Leanne was the one who was there looking for the signatures for Crockett and, and President Polk. And what's interesting is we couldn't find the page we were looking for with Polk's signature on it. And we were so excited to see the Crockett stuff that we said, you know, thank you for going out of your way for doing this for us, but we won't take up any more of your time and we'll take off. And right when we get in the car, the county clerk himself runs out and knocks on Colby's window and says, hey, she found what you're looking for. So we get out of the truck, we go back inside, and she says, here's the signature of James K. Polk. So we're yeah. both so excited to see that. And then we're about to leave. And Miss Lance says, you can't leave. The clerk is going to get something for you. And then he came back and presented us with this plaque. Peter yeah, Clark. a really neat silver plate with David Crockett on it, waving his hat. And it's just a really neat surprise. I think one big part of being an Alamo historian and living here and like living and breathing the Alamo for as long as Thomas and I have is that we kind of forget the, the impact that the Alamo has on other places throughout the United States. But those places have not forgot us. And we're so honored you brought that commemorative plaque back to the Alamo. As historians, what does it mean to you to see David Crockett's signature in that book? For me, it's uh, even here on site, look, working with documents and letters that he's written, it's pretty powerful to touch an item and to read the person's thoughts on paper. To do it in, in Lawrenceburg, for me, was very impactful because you're looking around at the land that he was walking on the community that he was a part of. And for me, like Colby just said, these people haven't forgotten about his story and how, what he goes on to do at the Alamo and to see their pride in, in what he had done and what other Tennesseans have done throughout history was just as impactful to me. I mean, I was super excited to see the book Colby had told me about it. So we were really crossing our fingers, hoping they'd let us in. And again, thank you to Leanna and to uh, Russ Brewer, who's the County clerk that let yeah. us in there. 
You know, when, when we do our job here at the Alamo, a lot of times our job focuses around the last few moments of these men's lives, how they died at the Alamo. We get that question a lot. How did Davey die? We get that question all the time. Yeah. To be able to go somewhere where he had been living his life peacefully without the thought of um, his in, in, you know, oncoming death and you know, just trying to provide for his family, that was a n- unique experience to be able to talk about like an actual human being. Instead of how did he die, how did he live? How did he yeah. live? That's exactly right. And we, after we left the county clerk, we went over to David Crockett State Park. And uh, Wes, the park ranger who I've known for five or six years now, um, he gave us a tour around the grounds and he actually showed us the river where Crockett's mill site was. And you feel that. You look around you, and you can tell David Crockett saw a lot of this country. And for his time and as small as the United States was back then, he's seen a lot and he chose that little valley with that little river and that was cool. You mentioned President James K. Polk a second ago, the 11th president of the United States. In Columbia, Tennessee, you got to visit his ancestral home. He was president from 1845 to 1849, and any Texas history buff knows 1845 was a big year. Yeah, a really big year. Columbia um, is another one of those towns that you have to go through if you're going through Tennessee. Um, it, it's a very historically important city in Tennessee, but uh, to be there in James K. Polk's uh, house is an awesome experience. He's personally um, my favorite president. Uh, I've got a lot of respect for the things he did for our country. But what's neat about that house is how well-preserved it is. They put a lot of time and effort into uh, taking care of that home. And on my visit, I asked them what in here is original in this house or, uh, you know, what is what is original? And she said, it is easier to point out the things that are not. They preserve so much of the Polk family history in that home. It's really stupendous. No, yeah, I agree. It was my first time there and uh, they did a fantastic job. The, our tour guide, we got a tour. She was fantastic. The other staff was was really great. And yeah, I think about the challenges that President Polk is set with. Texas annexation, the political legwork has been done pretty much under President Tyler, and Polk has been a supporter of annexing Texas, but he gets the glory because he gets to sign the paperwork, right? He gets to sign the documents to bring Texas in, and of course, the Mexican War happens um, under his presidency, which is a very controversial thing back then and even today, and trying to find the reasons why that conflict occurs and the um, repercussions that we probably are still feeling today from that conflict are very important to the American story. And it's places like that that get people interested in the history. Because how many people, when you're naming presidents, name James K. Polk, how many people know about the Mexican-American War? You know, sometimes people come to our site and falsely think that that's a part of it. Here, some people get that confused with the later war, the Spanish-American War. Yeah. So having places like that dedicated to that time in U.S. history is important that we can get a well-rounded understanding of our nation's history. One more stop in Tennessee, Shiloh National Military Park, another Civil War battlefield. And from the photos and videos you took, there was a lot to see there. That's one of the biggest battles, the onset of the American Civil War. And both sides think, this will be the only battle you'll need. We'll fight this, and then it'll end. And then at the end, I think there's close to a little over 20,000 casualties. And um, there are senators that are killed there, congressmen who are killed there. And after the battle, that America it gets a stark awakening and realizes that's not going to be as easy as they thought. Shiloh uh, spans several, several hundred acres uh, through the woods and you can get lost in there. There are, uh, I think close to 7,000 or 6,000, something like that um, monuments scattered, including the Texas one of pink granite. And um, we wanted to stop there because of the ties to Texas. And when you think about it, well, what does Tennessee have to do, right? Again, this is another thing that we've sort of forgotten as Texans that our story has impacted everybody there's a man that dies there. His name is Albert Sidney Johnston. Albert Sidney Johnston's actually in Texas prior to the American Civil War. He was the highest ranking officer in Texas for a very long time over Robert E. Lee and many others who would serve in the American Civil War. And he's actually living here in San Antonio and he's in charge of the quartermaster depot in the, in the pay system in Texas. And him and his son are going throughout Texas, taking care of the soldiers in our state. And then he leaves later on, and then when the Civil War kicks off, he joins the Confederacy. He's handpicked by Jefferson Davis. He ends up at the Battle of Shiloh, and of course, he loses his life. So we not only lose an an American, well, I would say an American hero, you know, at the time he's a Confederate, but we lose a Texan, and and one that had a big impact on our site. And there's a monument to him, and you stood there, and you 
were able to see a, a trail where he passed away. Yeah, that monument, if you get to go to Shiloh, it's one of the first battlefields that, since it's one of the first battles, it's one of the first battlefields that veterans start traveling to. And because the Union and the federal government could afford those monuments, their monuments start filling up the battlefield. When they have one of the first reunions, no Confederates really show up, just a handful. And the federal government realizes that and they actually pay for Confederate veterans tickets on trains to get them up there. They actually pay for some of the monuments to be erected. They're using federal dollars to build Confederate monuments. And Albert Sidney Johnson is one of those men that gets a really beautiful monument uh, dedicated to his life and um, his legacy. And when you go down the trail, there used to be a huge tree they propped his body up against, but it was um, destroyed during a tornado that passed through the area. And um, many eyewitnesses to his death after the war went down there and said, this is where his body was, this is where he expired. So You've mentioned some of the people who took time out of their days to show you their local history. What was their reaction when you say, hey, we're here from the Alamo? I think my, my personal favorite one is going to David Crockett State Park. And we show up with Wes, and he's taking us to the river, and there's a group of, of folks there visiting, and they're taking pictures. Our hats got a lot of compliments on the trip. And Good old this, cowboy yeah, hats. Yeah, and this, this nice lady comes up and goes, oh, I love your hats, and where are you guys from? I'm like, oh, we're from San Antonio, and what are you all doing here? Oh, we work at the Alamo, and she just went, oh. My goodness, <laughs> and you know, she bent over. I thought she was gonna faint. I was no, like, Oh man, she's gonna fall yeah. over. Yeah, and so we had some of our little gold Alamo pins and we gave them out to their group. And she just was telling us how she loves David Crockett and loves history. And a lady that she was with was somehow related to Crockett. And you got to tell them the story about that one time at this picnic. And it was like all these she's stories. screaming down to the river, telling everyone to stop what they're doing and come up and meet us. And so <laughs> the whole train of people comes up and she's you know, and introduced us to her son from michigan yeah. and it was it was awesome we got that treatment everywhere we went if we said we were the alamo everyone was excited they wanted to talk to us they want to talk to us about the projects that are going on but also yeah. the history of our site and that makes you proud that makes you yeah. very proud. we hope they come on down yeah visit the alamo we had a lady run through a, a traffic circle to take our picture next to david the david crockett <laughs> monument yeah she car. just hey y'all let me take your picture and yeah. she were like ma'am it's okay she's like nope nope and she came over and and yeah. you know just Dodging took our picture cars. yeah stood in the middle of the street and took our picture. So it was, uh, everybody was very nice. You know, you get these warm welcomes everywhere you go. And um, I think that's, that's what Texans usually give to people who visit our state. It's nice when you go somewhere else and you feel that same love and energy. And it's just, it's makes you proud. Our Alamo celebrities right here. <laughs> well, that's funny because one of the ladies asked, is that man a celebrity? And pointing to Colby and I said, yes, ma'am, he is. And he just gave me this look like, <laughs> why said, are you famous? <laughs> that is too good. Yeah. So obviously your mission was to learn about connections to the Alamo. But did you stop anywhere that just had nothing to do with the Alamo that you just found really interesting? The first place we stopped on the road trip, really historic site wise, from this portion of going to Washington was Camp Ford yeah, in Tyler, Ford. Texas. Yeah. And another one of those spots that you're driving down a busy highway and you're not really paying attention, you might miss. But you see the the split rail fencing. So you kind of know if you're a history person, you're like, split, split rail fencing is a key that something is interesting. I'm probably going to pull over. And Camp Ford was a prisoner of war camp that the Confederacy had set up there. Uh, for soldiers that were Union soldiers that were captured fighting in the Trans-Mississippi area. And kind of leading back to Shiloh, people think of the U.S. Civil War and they think of the Eastern Theater, of all the battlefields in Virginia. But the Trans-Mississippi Western Theater has very large battles. Shiloh's one of them. And those soldiers that are captured are getting sent to Camp Ford. And it starts off a little camp. They're, they're thinking it, the war will be over soon. And then they realize they need to expand that out. So it actually grows quite a bit larger than what you might be able to tell today. But those folks at that historical society out there in Tyler, you can tell that they're really passionate about that place. I know it's a struggle out there for these small sites, and I hope that people listening to this podcast, if you're in the Tyler area or passing through, stop there and take a look. Get involved in your community because a place like that is an important place to tell a story that affects all kinds of Americans. The other one was Franklin. I yep. almost forgot about the Battle oh, yeah. of Franklin. When we stopped there, what a stupendous effort done by that city to try and recapture a battlefield. And, you know, the city has grown up around the battlefield. Really, the, the city was always the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, but the amount of cultural landscape management they've done there to try to recapture portions of the battlefield and put artillery back on the site, it's kind of what we're doing here uh, at the Alamo, uh, stopping there. And they have a 
a cemetery to the Texans who had died there. Uh, a few dozen, if I remember correctly, yeah. had died at, at that battle. That was an impactful site. Um, another one of those battlefields, you're just kind of in awe at the, the absolute carnage that those men saw. Yeah. Terrible. I'm sure after driving more than 4,000 miles, you were grateful to get back home, spend the night in your own beds. But as historians, as researchers, describe the feeling of going to the places where history actually happened. Yeah, you'd think we would be used to it, working at, you know, one of the nation's most impactful historical sites. But there were moments, especially at Manassas, First Manassas, that was... That was a, kind of a game changer for me. I felt something on that battlefield. And uh, it's always nice to go to those places. And thinking back on it and how quickly all of it happened in, what, less than a week or so, um, that, man, it, 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 we saw a lot in such a short time period, and it kind of feels unreal. I agree with that. It, Manassas was very impactful for me. Um, Franklin, being in that small area, the, a lot of the battle happens in basically the backyard of, of the local family's house. And we think of the close fighting that's happening in the lawn barrack and in the church and in, just in the, the plaza area, Alamo Plaza today, in the, within the compound in 1836. And it kind of, you see the, the buildings that are riddled with shot and you say, that's the same kind of fire that these men are under in 1836. It kind of brought it back to, to you. But I think it's important for, for folks in our position to get out there and to do that, to feel that power of place. Because the issue with studying history for a lot of people is it's, black and white on a piece of paper. Yeah. You go to these sites, you smell the, the ground, you look at the ground, the terrain, you see the where things would have been posted, men, artillery pieces, houses, other things like that. And that's what makes history come alive for people. Yeah, it's, a, it's the tangibility of yeah. the site, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are hands-on learners. So if, if you're having, if you kind of like history, I really encourage you to go to these places and check them out because you can really lose yourself there, oh, yeah. especially at places like Davis, Fort Davis, where it's just, it's awesome. It's so pretty. Yeah. I yeah. bet something you really took away from this trip is that all of history is connected. Yeah. You pull a string, a historical string. In and, our case, the Alamo. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And you're going to pull dozens of others because the Alamo was, you know, this, this, it, its own gravitational pool that gathered people from all over the United States and, and the world uh, to come to this site. So therefore that history cannot be unconnected and it is impactful long after the event takes place. I think that's kind of become our ethos here in the curation research history department is everything is connected. It's how much work you want to put into it to find that connection, but it's going to be there. And so when people come to our site and they're thinking, well, what does this have to do with where I'm from or my story? Well, you dig deep enough, you're going to see somebody that reflects you and yeah. your story. That's it. And that's what makes it powerful. Colby Lanham and Thomas Ledesma, thank you so much for joining us. This was really fun to hear about your trip. Yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having us. Colby and Thomas were kind enough to take photos and videos of all these places. We've edited some of them together as travelogues, and we're posting them on the Alamo social media. We've posted some already. We still have a few more to go, so be sure to check those out. And in the podcast notes for this episode, we've linked to several of the places they visited in case you'd like to do a deeper dive into the unique history of each site. We've also linked to that photo of Colby and Thomas receiving a commemorative plaque after doing research on David Crockett at the Lawrence County, Tennessee clerk's office. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. <laughs>